Hello everyone. Today I want to talk about a 1949 movie, Letter from an Unknown Woman. This is directed by Max Ophels. And among other things, Max Ophels was a master of the emotion that we could possibly call the bittersweet. The bittersweet in romance, the bittersweet in life, the bittersweet in art. Uh, this is a story of a young girl around 1900, Vienna. She's 14 years old. Uh, she develops an infatuation with a pianist who, famous uh, pianist who moves next door to her in her apartment building. They never talk, they don't meet, but nevertheless she becomes infatuated with them and it becomes a, um, uh, a dream, a fantasy, um, it becomes an obsession, it becomes a delusion. Um, and the object of her desire, this pianist, he is, uh, although famous, he's, he's a, uh, he, he is a uh, rather superficial man. He looks at love, as many men do, as, as the art of seduction. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, he can have a night of love, two nights of love, a week, two weeks, and then he moves on to the next conquest. So he he looks at 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 his at, at his uh, the woman that he that he seduces, but he never really sees them, which is one of the the themes of the, of this film. And um, again, he he views himself uh, his talent as superficial, but it's very popular. He's he's incredibly good looking. Again, what's below the good looks? And then the film uh, explores the consequences of this kind of, these two attitudes towards love, uh, the toll it takes on both the man and the woman. Louis Jordan plays the pianist. Joan Fontaine uh, plays the young girl at this time of their life. They are so beautifully photogenic, it's, it's almost amazing. Um, and they glide through this film in Max Ophel's uh, elaborate uh, crane shots, his tracking shots, um, long takes up and down stairways. Ophuls was uh, was obsessed with stairways, and the stairways, to be truthful, is in the 1940s was used very dramatically by by many uh, other directors as well, Hitchcock and Notorious, for instance. But in in um, in in Ophuls movies, they are. They're used kind of fatalistically. They 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 they're expressive the stairways. At certain points in the film, we see um, we see Lisa, the the young girl, going up the stairway at various parts of her life um, that have very different emotional uh, uh, ascents and and descents down these stairways. Um, and uh, and they're they what what Ophuls in this in, as the characters move and they glide through this film, there's a great deal of movement. Ophuls often said that films should move; they they shouldn't be static. Um, but they we see them as they're kind of become increasingly trapped in their own imaginations. Both both characters are, and this is basically a two character movie. And and we get uh, we, we get a a sense of uh, Lisa's obsession. There's an Anna Karenina moment to be sure in it. Um, do you give up everything for the love of your life? Kind of moment. Um, and Ophel's also this was Ophel's second Hollywood film, and he brings a really uh, European um, kind of sophistication. There's an elegance to his movies. There's a very, very um, pleasing structure to them. As the, as the camera glides through scene after scene, they seem to almost lead into one another. Uh, it, creates a, a, it can create a very magical um, uh, atmosphere. Um, but again, he, 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 he didn't believe in close-ups, and, and so the, uh, oftentimes the, um, the studios would be very unhappy with him because he didn't give enough coverage. He, he, these, these shots that he sets up, and there's some incredibly complicated choreographed shots in this movie that are absolutely breathtaking. Uh, the studio didn't really appreciate that so much. They thought there was a lot of dead air. Where's the close-ups? Where can we edit to make the, make the uh, story punchier? 
and especially with Joan Fontaine because her husband, William Dozier at the time, was the executive producer of, of, of a Letter from an Unknown Woman, which was an independent film made for Universal International. And um, in, in Ophel's, uh, in his first film, Hollywood film, The Exile, he, he had been in Hollywood for seven years without getting an opportunity. He had one uh, opportunity to direct a film for President Sturgis and Howard Hughes uh, in the, another independent company where Stur he was treated, Ophels was treated terrible by President Sturgis who eventually takes over the film but it was shelved and it was almost completed when it was shelved as they ran out of money. Um, so, but he was eager to show that he could make a Hollywood film. He made The Exile with Douglas Fairbanks but this was his first real Max Ophels kind of film and he had a great screenplay by Howard Koch, who had written the letter. He had also worked on Casablanca. Uh, Franz uh, Planner's uh, cinematography is just absolutely, it's just an absolute uh, amazing uh, black and white and lighting and, uh, and being able to execute all these camera movements that, that Ophel's uh, um, demanded of, of these film crews. And, and then there's the set design by Alexander Galitzin. This is beautiful, the bric-a-brac. <laughs> There's so many elements in the scenic design of the film that plays into not just the atmosphere, but the drama of the movie. Produced by John Hausman, who had been a close friend, associate of Orson Welles. He was Welles' assistant on Citizen Kane, although I don't believe he got a credit for that. Um, he got a credit for that uh, uh, assistance in Citizen Kane, but he was part of the Mercury Theater. But also one of the collaborators is Stefan Zweig, and, and this, this is a short story. It's about 40 minutes, uh, 40 pages long, uh, and I, my library happened to have the collected <laughs> stories of uh, Stefan Zweig, so I picked up the, um, I picked it up yesterday, read it last night, and it's a great, great story. I mean, it, it very the movie, uh, the movie sticks to the basic plot. There's elements in the story that you could never make into incorporate into a movie version in uh, in the 1940s. Um, and he's a writer, and instead of being a pianist, he is a writer. And he is, um, um, and 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 the story is basically the letter with a short prologue in the beginning and the end. We we cut back to. Uh, to Louis Jordan reading the story several times during, during, the, um, during the movie. Um, and there's a commentary on this. Uh, this, is, this was an Olive signature uh, edition of Letter from an Unknown Woman, so the signature versions uh, have tons of extras on them and supplements, and boy, it's, it, it, these are really good. And um, the regular Olive uh, versions have no supplements at all. But there's a commentary by Let's uh, Let's Bacher, and he w he wrote a book that I actually read called Max Ophel's uh, in the Hollywood Studios, the four covering the four films, a little biography, biographical information on Ophel's, uh, and then he is a production historian, so we get the great detail of uh, I don't know how he he was able to find all the information he he found on the production of all four of these films, that, that these Hollywood films. And um, the, so it's, but his commentary is basically a rehash of the chapter <laughs> on Letter from an Unknown Woman. But nevertheless, it's, it's, uh, it's very insightful into how a movie is made, you know? I mean, you, you wonder how anything comes out of it as artistically satisfying as Letter from an Unknown Woman, given the uh, constraints and the pressures that go on in the making of a film. Uh, then we get a Tag Gallagher visual essay that's very good. Um, we get an interview with uh, two cinematographers who, um, who, who um, uh, contemporary cinematographers who talk about the influence of Max Ophuls and, uh, on their own career. Um, and then we get a, um, there's a, a very small booklet, uh, I love the, I love that cover of the booklet there with uh, James Mason reading the letter in the background. And it's got, got an absolutely uh, wonderful essay by Molly Haskell. And I struggled very much because it was very hard to read. <laughs> they, put these, they put these essays in, um, 
they put these essays in such in different color schemes and uh, you know my, magnif magnifying glasses uh, required versions. But I read this before. I read Molly Askell's um, um, uh, great essay before uh, I looked at the supplements, and, and uh, lo and behold, the, the, her essay is actually available on the big screen. I could have watched it on my 65-inch screen very easily, um, which was a nice touch. I just realized, I just you know would have loved if I had seen that beforehand. So uh, I'm going to do a couple more. Ophel's films that I recently purchased in the Criterion Collection, The Earrings of Madame D, which is his second to the last film, and also Lola Montez, which is his last film, just as a little bit of an introduction to what Ophel's was, um, his, his history in this era was that he came to Hollywood late in 1940. He was not part of the original group. Uh, he had no money. It took him a long time to get here. He was going to stay in Switzerland and be a theater director because he was early in his career. He was primarily a director of opera and, and theater. Uh, that didn't work out. He finally got a visa to America. He had many friends here. He had no money. Uh, he had to work as a script doctor. He had to rely on friends for, from Europe. Uh, Robert Seamock, uh, I had a bungalow in the back of his, he was doing well as a director in America. He, he put the family up uh, in, the bung, in the bungalow on his uh, property. Uh, Billy Wilder and many others uh, helped Offals along uh, until he could get his footing. And uh, again, he, his films were, he made big hits in Europe, but uh, Meyerling and um, Liebelag, but uh, they did not, received much, if any, uh, distribution in the U.S. So Ophels was largely unknown in, in these films, even though they existed, they, they did not include English uh, subtitles. So no one really in the Hollywood studios could see, you know, what kind of filmmaker he was. And he had a reputation that he was one of these genius filmmakers in uh, art film. And of course, uh, the, the last thing a Hollywood studio wants is an art film director. Uh, but he got his chance uh, doing the exile. Uh, he he knew how to bring in a picture on budget, which was a big help. Um, and even though the studios didn't like his long takes and his lack of coverage, uh, if a picture fell behind, he'd go and say, "Well, just let me do it my way <laughs> with this long take because we can do it all in a day, and we don't have to spend another couple days on coverage, and we can we, we can catch up on the schedule." Um, and uh, so then he made Caught uh, with uh, Robert Ryan, Bel Barbara Bel Geddes, uh, which is an olive, standard olive uh, Blu-ray with not, without any extras. And then he made The Reckless Moment uh, with James Mason, who was also in Caught, um, and also um, uh, Joan Bennett was in it. Uh, and uh, the, these two films are, are available on uh, YouTube for free. As of November 2021, pretty good shape. The Exile I watched. It's, I, I was able to watch it, but it really wasn't in very good shape. And then, uh, and these films were all made for independence. And Ophuls was tired of the independence because it was always where are we going to get the money. He really craved to get a studio contract, MGM or whatever. And uh, but uh, that never came to fruition. He was in France. He was actually in Italy. He was going to. The, they were planning on a, uh, Greta Garbo's return, and she actually flew to Italy, but then again, the money ran out. Um, so he, in the meantime, he made La Ronde, which was a big hit in Europe uh, and, and was nominated for a couple of Academy Awards. He thought this would be, this would grab the attention of the Hollywood studios. And then he made La Poisere, um, which was based on Guy de Maupassant, uh, um, three stories by de Maupassant, and, uh, and then he made the two, two films that are on Blu-ray. Both those two films were on, uh, those previous two films, Laurent and La Poisere, were on uh, Criterion DVD. They never upgraded them to Blu-ray, and they also are still available on, um, on uh, the Criterion channel. Okay, so uh, thanks for everyone who managed to listen to me this far. I really do appreciate it. As always, comments are welcome. Take care.